for your presence here, that you are our God that's with us and leads us in the way that we should go. So continue to lead us in this service and be with us and help us to delight in your presence and in your word together. And we ask and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I may be seated. You are taking your seats by the book of James and continuing through our study through the book of James, find James chapter 2. Before we read our passage this morning, I want to sort of set it up for us. I want you to consider a question. Would you believe me if I told you today that before I walked in here, I was out here working on something right on, right on the Commerce Drive here, and this massive semi-truck just flew on through and ran me over, but I got up and came in here and preached anyway, right? You have a little bit of a hard time believing that, right? I'm not disheveled at all. I, I don't look any different. I still have all my limbs, right? It'd be a little hard to believe that I came face to face with a force as powerful as a speeding truck, and I wasn't changed, right? How much more for those of us who claim to be impacted by the God of the universe? And it's this issue of life change and the relationship between faith and works that James turns in James chapter 2, beginning in verse 14. So let's dive in. Look with me. James chapter 2, beginning verse 14, and we'll read to the end of the chapter. The Word of God says, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works, and faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and was counted to him as righteousness, and he was called a friend of God. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. This is the word of God. As we've worked our way through the book of James, we come this morning to the most difficult, most debated, most controversial passage in the whole book. If there's one thing people know about the book of James, it's, well, faith without works is dead. That's sort of the, the most popular thing people take away from this book. And for many, it becomes hard to understand. But isn't that what James is saying is hard to understand or that we often make it more difficult to understand than it needs to be? James was never one to mince words, right? As we've seen going through this book, he sort of says it like it is. But could we be tempted to misunderstand him because we try to get James to enter into a conversation he simply wasn't having? This is a controversial passage for many. It's caused confusion for many as I think about faith and works. And people begin to ask, do I have the sort of faith James is describing here? Some try to say that there's a contradiction between what James says here and what Paul writes about being justified by faith alone. Let me show you just on the surface level sort of this quote-unquote problem. Look at these verses here. 
Romans 5, 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And in James 2, 24, that we saw a second ago, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. People will put verses like this up and go, well, which is it? It appears like Paul's saying we're justified by faith alone, and James is saying that we're justified by faith and works. And there's a lot of verses one could put up and sort of compete against each other. And it illustrates an important principle, one of the most important things I can tell you when it comes to Bible interpretation. What you need is not more Bible verses, but more paragraphs and chapters and books. In other words, friends, you know the verses of the Bible were put there, the, the actual numbers, right? The referencing verse system was put there later in order to make it easier for us to sort of find where things are. Not so we could take one verse kind of out of its context, take another verse out of its context, drop them into another context, and then say, look, they don't get along. None of us read anything else this way, and we're tempted to misunderstand the Bible because we will isolate one verse apart from the rest of what that writer is saying. So what we're going to see partially is that Paul and James aren't opposed to one another, but rather they complement each other. Both are going to deal with very different issues as it relates to faith and works. Paul is primarily dealing with the sufficient ground of our justification before God. In other words, that we're set right with God through faith alone in the finished work of Christ, apart from our works. That there's no other way to be right with God. You can't work your way there. You've simply got to place your faith and your trust in Jesus, and that's where righteousness is found. But James is dealing with something different. He's dealing with the necessary fruit of faith. You can think about it as justification before others. How do we show that we are believers? How does the world see it? That there's certain fruits which are meant to accompany faith. James is telling us that faith is meant to be sort of a combo meal. And that you got to have the fries and the drink of works to truly have the combo meal there. You've got to have them thrown in. And James, in this section, wants to contrast true and false faith. His issue is never to say true faith in Jesus doesn't save. But rather, he's trying to show us that there are false faiths. There are ways to have faith that are false because they have no works. Have you ever heard, maybe you played the old game, two truths and a lie, and you have to guess the lie? Where here, James flips it on its head and does two lies and the truth. Two lies and the truth. Let's look at the first lie, the first false sort of faith that James wants us to see. First, the, lie, the first lie is a dead faith. That's the first thing we've got to beware of, is having a dead faith. Look at me in verse uh, 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that Faith saved him. It's so important if we're reading this text that we read the small words because the small words are just as inspired as the big words. Notice, what good is it if someone says that they have faith but they have no works? They make a claim but they don't have the ability to back it up. They're all talk, no action. We can make claims all day long but claims by themselves aren't worth anything. Friends, I can claim that I'm an NBA all-star player. Drop me on a court and we'll figure out whether I really am or not, right? And James even offers an illustration. Look at verse 15. If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? James almost asked the same question in reverse order. He says, what good is it if you see someone in need and you tell them, I care about you and I want you to have these things, but you don't do anything about it. You make a claim and you don't back it up. You don't even intend to back it up. 
In the illustration, the, compa the man made compassionate claims that proved to be empty because he had no compassionate works. And in the same way, we can have empty words because of empty actions. Dead faith is an insincere faith. A faith that's one in name only. One that makes empty claims to faith, but doesn't have anything else to go alongside it. Here's sort of the sub-point. A dead faith is all talk and no walk. A dead faith is all talk and no walk. They make these claims, but there's nothing there to prove it's true. And James asks a very important question that, again, requires us to notice the small words. Look at the end of verse 14. Can that faith save him? Notice he's speaking about a particular kind of faith. Yes, faith alone in Jesus can save, but not a faith that's insincere. No one that's just a claim with nothing to back it up. The question is rhetorical with an obviously negative answer. No, a dead faith, one that is faith in name only, cannot save. And if we didn't get it the first time, James even adds this at the end of the paragraph in verse 17. So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. <coughs> it's pretty clear James is trying to send us a message that a dead faith is a claim that is never backed up. These folks may have been known for being good church going folks. They might have been known as hearers of the word, but James says they weren't doers. They were probably known as very religious, but not as followers of Jesus. They were not known for their claim to obedience to their Savior. They were all talk. And no walk. And would that describe any of us? That's what James would want us to consider this morning. Look what he goes on to say, verse 18. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works and I will show you my faith by my works. Notice that works weren't meant to be added to faith to sort of give faith its true value or effectiveness. Like faith isn't enough, but rather he's saying that works show that faith is genuine. Imagine being back in school, and did you ever have show and tell, right? And some kids made big claims until it was time to show them, like, man, my dad bought me a dragon. Okay, bring it in, bud. Show us, right? You really got that dragon? Bring it in. Show us. Well, dad says I can't bring it in. Oh, okay, I'm sure, right? What if you were wanting to come in to show and tell and show your faith in Jesus? How would you do it? Could you show your faith apart from works? Rather, you would show your faith through works, right? Maybe you'd bring in a picture from the day you were baptized. And went, hey, look, I follow Jesus in baptism. I'm not saying the baptism saved me. But I'm saying, hey, this was done as an act to show that my faith is genuine. Maybe you'd bring a recent Bible study you're doing. Maybe you'd show about and talk about serving in vacation Bible school with a person you recently shared the gospel with. None of these make you a Christian, but they are tangible evidences of the intangible reality of faith. And James is telling us to show and tell, Christian. Don't just tell. Don't just make empty claims that are all show. That's a dead faith. That's the first lie that James wants us to see. Then James turns to the second lie. Lie number two is a demonic faith. Lie number two is a demonic faith. Look at verse 19. You believe that God is one you do well, even the demons believe and shudder. That's a scary verse, my friends. He tells us that demons have really good doctrine. Demons know their Bible better than some of us do. They can believe and have mental assertions about the truth of God, yet still remain demons that hate him. 
They can even have an experience in the presence of God. And yet still, hey, remember, demons were once angels in his presence that fell away. They knew what it was to be in the presence of God. And yet they hated him. But these truths didn't make any difference in their lives. They remained set against God. They remained against his word. And James warns us that, friends, we can have all the right answers, yet not tr trust in the one who is the answer. We can have doctrine without devotion. Demons believe and they shudder. They tremble in fear. And he's warning us that some of us are content to know and yet go no further. Here's a good reminder. Good doctrine alone doesn't save. You're not going to get into heaven because you can name the books of the Bible in order. Or because he's going to give you a doctrine exam before you get in and you could pass it. Though none of those things are bad to know. If a dead faith is all talk and no walk, a demonic faith is all head and no heart. A demonic faith is all head and no heart. I can give you, I'm going to give you a couple illustrations of this. Friends, you can know all the physics around the chair that you sit in today. You know exactly how it's put together, the thread count on the back of the seat. But if you don't sit in it, it's no good to you. You can know, and then friends, you can know, right? There's a mental knowledge of something, and then there's a personal relational knowledge, and those are not the same thing. Friends, would you trust a mechanic who's never driven a car? No. Well, I've read all the books there is to know about cars. Friends, that's why we don't have Amish auto shops set up in this town. Right? I don't care if they tell you they read everything there is to know about cars. If you're driving a horse around, I'm not taking the car to you, right? Friends, how would we feel if you're being wheeled back to the surgery? And they put the anesthetic on you. You're kind of starting to lose consciousness a little bit. And the last thing you hear is that your, sur your surgeon just finished medical school last night and you're his first patient by himself. How are you feeling? I'm not feeling good, right? How would you feel to have a surgery done by someone who's never done it before? None of us hire a contractor who's never built anything. And he says, in much the same way, Christian, we can claim to know and yet not really know. We can claim to have faith but have never done anything. You know who had a demonic faith? Judas Iscariot. It's the perfect example of a man who had demonic faith. He had been with Jesus. He could tell you all about the miracles and the healings. He had heard all of Jesus' teaching over and over and over. He could tell you what Jesus loved to eat for breakfast. It's a pretty close knowledge of him. He could probably have the textbook answer, but didn't have a love for God or others. One day, Jesus was eating with Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, and Mary, not his mother, the other Mary, entered in and anointed Jesus' feet and wiped and put this expensive oil all over him. And this was an act of deep devotion that seemed unorthodox on the surface, but came from a sincere heart of devotion. And Judas responds in a very interesting way. He responds with a question of practicality apart from consideration of Jesus. John chapter 12, we see this. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? Notice, Judas asked the question he thinks Jesus wants him to ask. He, he sort of goes, well, shouldn't we give this money to the poor? What's this whole thing about loving Jesus ahead of loving others? But it was nothing but a false flag because we read this, John 12, 6. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put in it. Judas is a warning to us. You can put on a great front for others. You can pass the theology exam. The demons certainly could. 
yet you cannot know and love Jesus. Because mental assertion is not what it means to have faith. Mental assertion is not what it means to have faith. The Apostle Paul tells us that Jesus resurrected and he walked around for 40 days after his resurrection. And we're told that at one time he appeared before 500 people before he ascended into heaven. Yeah, what's really interesting is when you open up Acts chapter 1 after Jesus has ascended, there was only 120 people in the early church. That means there were hundreds of people who had even seen the resurrected Jesus, who probably testified to it, but weren't willing to give their heart and their lives to him. And they hadn't joined with the body of Christ. There's a difference between a knowledge of distance and a knowledge of nearness. Y'all know this? You grow up in a small town, you know everybody. But you know people around you in a very different way, right? It's one thing to know their family and know them, but it's another to have a, a knowledge of nearness. Friends, a distant, cold faith of, of nothing but mental assertion as a demonic faith. And James is clear, that faith does not save. But James wants us to spend more time focused on the truth than on the lies. He wants us to see, yes, the two truths, dead faith and demonic faith. But he wants us to consider now the truth, a demonstrated faith. The truth, what we're meant to have, is a demonstrated faith. That's his whole point, to make sure we have a faith that's shown and not just claimed. In fact, James wants to show us that an empty faith is useless. Verse 20. You want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? Then he's going to give now three illustrations of true faith. He's going to turn now and offer us three illustrations of true faith. And he starts with a guy named Abraham. Particularly, we're going to see Abraham and his sacrificial faith. Abraham and his sacrificial faith. Notice verse 21. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? You see that faith was active along with his works and his faith was completed by his works. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness and he was called a friend God. Man, I love the Bible. <laughs> I love this illustration because he wants us to consider Abraham, the father of the Jews, called elsewhere the father of faith. And he asked the question, was Abraham justified when he offered up Isaac on the altar? He's alluding to the events of Genesis 22. And it's one of the three places in James where he's going to use this word justified. Which means to be declared to be righteous. To be declared to be right. To say that person is just. Just in God. And then the question we've got to consider. Who, what's going on? Who's doing the declaring? Who is doing the justifying? Is he saying that God declared Abraham righteous when he gave up Isaac? That what he needed to do, what Abraham needed to do in order to be saved was to give up his son? James actually seems to correct that idea in verse 23. When he says, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. He's, he wants you to know some of your Bible here because that's a quote from Genesis chapter 15. Right? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he's telling us... Abraham was justified before God, counted righteous by faith alone, 15 years before he ever offered up his son. So what's happening in verse 21 and in Genesis 22 wasn't justification before God, but rather it was Abraham showing others the trueness of his faith through offering up Isaac. Notice verse 22. Notice the small words again. You see that faith was active along with his works, and that faith was completed by his 
works. This faith was brought to its intended purpose, and you could see that this faith was active because he was willing to offer up his son. The emphasis is on the genuineness of his faith. All of us who know our Bibles know if you want to talk about the greatest act of faith that Abraham ever did, it was he was willing to give up his son. And that's exactly the point of the illustration. Genesis 22 shows us that God, right after God provided a lamb in the place of Isaac, we see the whole purpose of the incident was this. Genesis 22, 12. And the angel said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him, for I know that you fear God, seeing that you did not withhold your son, your only son, from me. <laughs> in fact, if you read through Genesis, and we studied through that book uh, last year together, it's very clear Abraham seemed to know that God was going to somehow give his son back to him. So the whole thing was to display the trueness of his faith and to show that he feared the Lord. It was to show the genuineness of his relationship with God. His faith was shown to be true because it was sacrificial. Would we say that our faith is sacrificial? Does following Jesus cost us something? Because that's one of the big tests. Whenever you begin to lose things, or potentially lose things, in order to have to follow Jesus, friends, that's when the rubber meets the road. We see this in Jesus' parable of the soils. The soils that are not shown to be fruitful are choked out by the pleasures and the love of the world. And friends, after sacrifice, the faith was shown. After, after all of that, we must ask ourselves, would we give up anything in order to follow our king? And Jesus actually tells us, count the cost before you pick up and follow me. And friends, some of us, if we won't commit ourselves to even spending time with God's people, what do we think it will mean to actually, when the rubber meets the road, we have to sacrifice something in order to follow him? And I want to tell you something, young, old, wherever you are, all of us, following Jesus in the days ahead, if it hasn't already, is going to cost you something. It's going to cost you something to be a Christian because, friends, I don't know if you've looked around, but we used to live in a world that was pretty comfortable with just calling yourself Christian. They were very comfortable with a dead faith. But, friends, nowadays, friends, we have a culture that's dead set against even being a Christian. It's not a popular thing. You must be willing to be exiled, outcasted, called names, to even lose it all for the sake of Jesus. A sacrificial faith is a true faith. Abraham wasn't made righteous by his works. He was declared righteous before God by faith. But Abraham did bring his faith to maturity and show his faith through sacrifice. Verse 24 brings us the emphasis, brings us the point again. You see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. See how much clearer this verse is when we put it back in the context and we just rip it out like we did at the beginning of the sermon, right? You can observe a person's faith because works are the flesh that it puts on. <coughs> you cannot see someone's faith apart from works. Next, he turns to a second illustration, though. So the faith and works of a lady named Rahab. And Rahab had a risky faith. Rahab had a risky faith. He just gives us one verse, verse 25. And in the same way, was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another Way. Notice, in the same way, he's making the same sort of point, but notice he, who he's using to illustrate the point. Not Abraham, the father of faith, but Rahab, the harlot. Abraham, a man. Rahab, a woman. Abraham, father of the Jews. Rahab, a Gentile. Friends, he includes both of these intentionally to show that anybody can follow after Jesus. Both of these people were known for leaving the behind the nations they were born to in order to follow the God of Israel. And you couldn't think of a more perfect example with both illustrations. 
Rahab's remembered for her works, but also Hebrews tells us this. Hebrews 11.31, by faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient, but she was given a friendly welcome to the spies. She is remembered by her faith and her works. In fact, we're told she displayed and demonstrated her faith by receiving the spies and sending them out. These are the events of Joshua chapter 2. She receives the spies through hospitality, and by doing so, she was risking her neck. The people of the land would have killed her if they found out she was hiding them. But she believed the promise of God that the land she lived in was going to belong to Israel, and so she received and hid the spies as an act of faith. And James, again, is not giving this to us simply to test our Bible trivia. His whole point is verse 24, that you can see a person is justified. You can see their faith by their works. You can't see it otherwise. And Abraham, or Rahab is such a beautiful example because Rahab is also an incredible example of God's redemption. God turned her life around and displayed that life change through the way she treated the spies. We don't read anything else about this woman outside of that passage, but we knew she believed the promises of God. She served the people of God. And though some may have remembered her for what she was, she's remembered rather for her godly legacy of faith. Friends, some of you today may, may, may be remembered for something that you did in the past, for works and a way you lived in the past. But friends, you can look to the God of Rahab and receive the good news of grace. To have your legacy of your life turned around and rather being remembered for what you did, be remembered for the God you serve. And he comes to the third and the final illustration. Verse 26. For as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. He gives us the example of body and spirit, a living faith. A living faith. Again, using this example of a body without a spirit. A body, faith, is dead unless it has life, works. Here is what he's saying here. He closes the illustration by showing the opposite of a dead faith. Rather than a faith that is dead, our faith is called to live. Would those who see our lives say we have a faith that is living? Faith that is animated? Not a faith that is cold or lukewarm, but one that is white, hot for Jesus. Because James isn't alone in addressing the false faith of others. In fact, James pulls almost all of his teaching out of this book right out of the words of Jesus. And Jesus will repeat an illustration throughout his ministry about a tree and its fruits. This is in Matthew chapter 7, verse 17 to 20. But Jesus, again, uses this illustration. He wasn't afraid to repeat a sermon every now and again. And he said this, So every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. So I would consider the picture. Trees produce fruit. The fruit doesn't make the tree what it is but rather the fruit displays what kind of tree that it is. Friends, a banana tree is a banana tree before it produces a single banana. But friends, it's certain that a healthy tree is going to produce good fruit. A good tree, a picture of true faith, will produce good fruit. It's the necessary outsourcing of saving faith, no if ands or buts about it. In fact, a good tree, he says, cannot produce bad fruits. But he says a bad tree produces bad fruit. This is a picture of a worthless fruit. A fruit you left out to rot. Those bananas you bought a week ago. But they came off the tree that way. 
And Jesus would later wither a fig tree as a symbol of Israel's evil works, that they were withered and dead. And this is poignantly echoing James's words in chapter 2. He says you're going to recognize them by their fruits. Faith, apart from their works, is dead, diseased, demonic, withering. And that sort of faith cannot save you. But sadly... It's the faith many of us are content to have. It's the faith many of us are content to have. And here's the good news, friends, that the resurrected Jesus is able to resurrect dead faith to life. He alone, by trusting in him, is able to bring bad trees and make them into good trees and produce good fruit in your life. He says, abide in me. And I will cause you to bear fruit. Through faith, Jesus can transform your fake faith into a fruitful but the question we need to ask ourselves for self-reflection is this. What sort of faith do I have? Is, our, is my faith dead? What would I be able to bring to show and tell? Is my faith demonic? Is it all up here, but it's not made the journey to be giving my heart and life and affections to Jesus? Is he simply a savior in my head, but not a lord over my life? Or do I have a true faith that's demonstrated through works? Take seriously the words of 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? The invitation in these next moments is one of self-reflection. And if you find yourself with a dead or demonic faith and wanting to have a true faith in Jesus, you can come forward, pray where you are, talk to me. Whatever you need to do to do business with God, to examine ourselves, to see if Jesus be in us. And may we not fail the test. But may we be found to have built our lives on the foundation that will never, never let us fall. Let's stand and let's pray together. Father in heaven, we have heard a heavy word from you today. There are many of us who may have claims to love and follow you, but have no works to show for it, and you say that isn't a faith that will save us. Many of us are banking on our mental assertion of facts about you without having a loving relationship with you. But God, awaken in all of us a faith like Abraham, like Rahab. Give us a spirit that fills the body of our life so that we might be animated to serve you. God, help us to build our hope, our lives, our all on you. May we put our trust in your death, burial, and resurrection to bring us to new spiritual life and to serve you with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we ask and we pray all these things in Jesus' name.